Welcome to the 2023 Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, filmed on location at the IGFA and brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. You're about to learn from teams of some of the top saltwater fishing pros and how you really glean the most from the Saltwater Sports from the Seminar Series is listen for the little subtleties, the small things that we are doing to put together a great catch or to get a few fish when times are tough out there. So let's get right down to it and start off the Saltwater Sports from the National Seminar Series. Coming to you from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, it's the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Get ready, everybody. Here's George Poveromo. Welcome to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, filmed on location at the IGFA and brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Trophy Stripe Bass is our session. And we have a heavy hitting panel here that's gonna take you into the subtleties of catching the large, trophy class of bass. And we have, out of Connecticut, but he fishes everywhere from New York on up through New England, Captain Corey Crocheter. <laughs> Sit next to him, the pride of Cape May, New Jersey, the one, the only Captain Tom Daffin. And sitting in on this session, you might be wondering, what is Captain Bouncer Smith, legendary South Florida guide, sitting in on the Trophy Stripe Bass panel. And we'll give you a quick synopsis, is that Bouncer Smith also spent time out of Maryland in fishing places up there. And he has a lot of subtleties on how these big bass relate to maybe our snook, because a lot of the habits are the same. So let's get right into this. And Corey, I'm gonna start with you. Take me through a little, maybe a seasonal kind of a deal when you could target the big ones through New England. What time frame are you looking at? And then really where, what kind of habitat? Sure, so it starts for me in uh, late May. And in late May, I have them in Western Long Island Sound, which is uh, off the shoreline of Connecticut. And we're chasing those fish in open water, pretty much in the middle of the sound. And uh, what we're doing is we're focusing on um, large bunker schools and we're getting on those bunker schools and throwing very large plugs. We're using like uh, surface spooks and big poppers and stuff like that. And we're basically teasing the bass to the surface in anywhere from 40 to 80 feet of water. And how do you work the plug? I know it sounds very basic, but is there a fast retrieve or is it a, a, a short, hard pop, let it sit? What is the right retrieve if one exists to bring them up? Uh, it very much varies, but a lot of times what you want to do is you want to cast your plug after you've marked the fish or you've seen them boiling on the surface, and you'll give it a couple of twitches and then let it sit, maybe two, three seconds, and then you'll start your retrieve again. You go, you know, one, two, three sweeps of the rod, let the lure sit, and if you get a strike, if not, just keep doing that all the way to the boat. A lot of times, the fish will be 10 feet from the boat and they'll follow it the whole time. They won't commit until the last second. So you want to keep that cadence almost the whole time, and nine times out of 10, they hit it on the pause. Now, are you marking any of these fish on the sonar, or are you just going to sit and work these uh, men hating knowing that those bass ought to be under them? No, you will mark them. A lot of times, if you don't, you'll see the bait in the general area where you're fishing, and you'll see the fish on the sonar, and they won't be on the surface. They'll be down 15, 20 feet, um, but when they're down 15, 20 feet, that's enough for them to come up to the surface after you, they see these big plugs. All right, now did you say that that was a spring deal or a fall? That's spring. Um, but the spring stuff really is, is keyed in on like a six week period in May and June. And is the larger fish in that spring period yes. and more yes. to school That's bass what, towards the fall? Correct, yeah, you'll get your, your bigger trophy fish, you know, your 30 plus pound fish in the spring and you will get them in the fall, but not in as big as numbers. Understood. Tom, let's go up to Jersey. I mean, uh, you're the undisputed mayor, king, whatever, you know, names we made up for you because you know that area about as good as anybody. When it comes to getting trophy striped bass, now you and I had done a show out of Atlantic City. I had sent the boat up and we crushed the bass under bunker schools like that too. So trophy bass in your area, is it all just regulated to the bunker run or is there different ways that you're finding them? So over recent years, uh, Cape May was like a huge destination yeah. for striped bass fishing. We had the Cape May Rips, we had the Delaware Bay, and it seems over the recent years, there's been a shift in the migration, a little more to the north. That's why we were fishing out of Atlantic City instead of out of Cape May. We we're running up the beach farther and trying to cut them off. Mm -hmm. They're coming down a little bit later, so we want to try to start our season a little bit earlier. In the spring times, we could still catch plenty of, of trophy size striped bass in the Delaware Bay. Fishing bunker chunks, mainly in very shallow water. When I mean very shallow, like I pretty much got to ground my boat and then cast shallower to them for the most part. 
uh, and that's usually done in May and the very beginning of June. And then later on in the season, we start to get a run of fish more towards Thanksgiving now. And with probably the best fishing, closer to Christmas and even into the new year. Is this inshore or offshore? Now, the fall fishery is pretty much based all in the ocean from the zero to the three mile line. With the beginning part of the run, the fall the beginning part of the fall run being your best chance to catch big fish, those 40, 50 pound fish. Interesting. We're going to circle back to this. We're going to take a commercial break. You're watching the Saltwater Sports and National Seminar Series, Trophy Stripe Bass. We'll be right back after a few short commercials. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Simrad. Go with Simrad and go with confidence. Penn, let the battle begin. Roths, comprehensive oceanographic analysis for fishing. Mercury Outboards, go boldly. Angle, portable fridge freezers and high performance coolers. George will be right back. Welcome back to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. You're back to watching Trophy Stripe Bass as part of the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. Working with Captain Balancer Smith, Captain Tom Daffin, and Captain Corey Crocheter. And Tom, we were talking about that uh, fall migration. And again, was this along the beach? And also, what is the... The, the, I know there's a certain zone that you need to fish, or catch these fish in that you're not prohibited to fish past a certain zone. That's still in play or not? how does that work? Absolutely. So our state waters run out to the three mile line. It starts the EEZ, the exclusive economic zone, outside of three miles, which is federal waters. The striped bass fishing, whether you're catching them, tarring them, anything, is strictly prohibited by the federal government. And it has to do with protecting the striped bass mm -hmm. uh, from recreational, for hire, commercial, whatever have you. We're just, you're not even allowed to target them. You're not allowed to catch them, release them. Now, Balancer, and correct me if I'm wrong, they have a lot of habits that are very similar to our snook, the big ones. What, would, what could you add to this? A prime example was when I fished in Montauk, New York. When we go for snook, like in Hallover Inlet or any inlets, we free line a pinfish. And a fresh pinfish, if you free line it, it'll dive down to the bottom. Where are you hooking that pinfish to make uh, it do that? We usually bridle them to the eye sockets. I went to Montauk, New York, and they were using live porgies, not pogies, not menhaden, but the bottom fish, the porgies. And they were using a little tie wrap to bridle through the eye socket with a big treble hook. And I said, oh, that's really bad for the bass. Let's go with the circle hook. So we were bridling live porgies and doing the exact same thing. We would free line the porgies. They would dive down when they were fresh and we caught big striped bass, 35 to 45 pounds. And I, I agree with this circle hook because a lot of friends that chunk and we're up there, we've done chunking shows. And I said, why don't you take a circle hook and bridle it in a chunk bait like we use for bottom fish and all that and uh, you know, and it's just like our snook. And then when you do that, that hook won't turn back in the bait. You let the rod holder set that circle hook. And once the circle hook is planted, it usually stays in the bass's mouth and it's better for the bass. So uh, not to you know, digress there, but Corey, going back to these trophy striped bass, you and I got together, it was it July up there at yeah, Rhode was, Island? That was in July. To target these big bass. When do you see that season migration start to make their way north? Uh, and obviously you could tell through the intel where they're at. And then when you set forth, again, what are you looking for? You and I fished a structure and we marked the bass too, but someone who's not your experience level, they're in the area, what could you tell them as far as trying to locate an area that might give them a fighting shot at getting a nice trophy bass? Um, main thing you want to look for is a uh, piece of structure. So you want to find something that's got a good drop off or a good ledge or what we call a hill, you know, a big rise up and then a rise down on the backside. Um, <clears throat> depending on the tide, you're going to want to be either on the, the front side or the backside. Okay. And, and again, depending on the tide, you know, do they stay in the up current when the tides hit them or do they stay low on the backside of it when the tide? So some of our snook, you think the same principle that the snook will be on the down current side or something, not expending energy coming up. But in some cases, they stay right in the front where that wall of water hits and there's like a little lull there too. I'm exactly. Sorry. So tell me in the tide, uh, are they up uh, tide or are they down tide of a structure? They're up tide. 
So yeah. they're hanging on the upside. Yeah, too. they're on the front side of the okay. structure. Yeah, and they'll be nose down into it. So that way, like you said, they're going to conserve their energy and just sit down in the tide there. And they're basically waiting for something to come right in their face and go over them. So that way they can just sweep up real quick, grab their bait, grab their food, and go back down. Interesting. And then is a matter of making drifts over that prime structure? Yes. Yeah. And sometimes it takes a few drifts just to figure out which drift is going to work because those fish might be only in a very small area. It could be 50 to 100 feet wide. And if you're 20 feet off to the side of that, you could just keep drifting and just not catch anything. So sometimes you have to figure out your drift where you're going to go over that piece of structure. You might have to adjust. You might have to move up current a little bit or down current a little bit. So you hit that prime spot where most of the fish are sitting. And once you mark an fish in the sonar, then you know they're there. Exactly. It's the matter of trying to get the, the strikes to yes. come out of that, yeah. in that case there. And again, you're uh, an at that we did, strictly artificials yeah. with the plastic eels, which we're going to get in the subtlety of that mm -hmm. right after we get back from this commercial break. But you're watching the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series filmed on location at the IGFA. Trophy Stripe Bass is the panel, and we're coming right back with a panel of experts. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Rapala, your best shot at a world record. Suffix, always use the best line. VMC, your expert in hooks. Williamson Lures for the Pelagic Playground. Starbright, blending technology with performance since 1973. George will be right back. Welcome back to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. Trophy Stripe Bass is a panel of the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. We're at the IGFA, and the series is brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. I'm working with Captain Corey Crochetier, dealing with a trip he and I had done off of Rhode Island for the Trophy Stripe Bass in the July timeframe and the subtleties of locating these fish and structure and then trying to get them on artificials. Now, one of the things that was distinguished there, a lot of people use live eels. Mm -hmm. You say the, the, the plastic artificial eels could be even more effective if fished right than live eels. Correct. Elaborate on that and then get into the subtleties of actually working them in a situation like we did. Okay, so when you're fishing a live eel, most of the time, you're gonna set your leader off your weight you know, to a certain length. You're gonna drop it down to the bottom and basically take a half a crank off the bottom and just kind of let it sit there. Um, you're not really moving the bait, you're just kind of letting it swim do its thing. So you're not really working much of a column. It's just basically wherever it ends up sitting is where you're gonna fish it. Uh, with the artificials, you can basically, you can touch bottom, make sure you're still on the bottom, and that's where those fish are gonna be. And you can lift it up a little bit, lift it up a little higher, so that way if like you're marking them and just say, the tide may, uh, may be moving real fast, those fish will be real tight to the bottom. You don't want to lift it too high because you're going to lift it right over their heads. Um, tide slows down a little bit. They might lift up off the bottom a little bit. You might have to lift your bait a little higher. Um, and with the artificials, you could just really target your zone a little bit better than you can with the live eels. Understood. And, and Tom, going back with you, when you work in these uh, bunker schools like we did on the Troll, and what is really the key in getting them on the Troll around the bunker schools? So when we're approaching like big bunker schools and all, uh, these fish tend to be able to, tend to circle the bait more so than try to ram through a center of these uh, big bunker pods. Like some of these are just straight freight trains. I mean, you saw it on our show. Uh, you know, you go through a big bumper school and all the rod tips are banging like crazy. You don't get the bite until the rod tips start to stabilize again. So you're on the outside of the school. Whenever I get bit, I immediately hit an MOB on the machine. And once we get the fish in, get the baits back out, I'll make a turn and I'll go right back over top of that same MOB uh, again. What are some of the subtleties that you have learned over your career that you would say maybe most of the people trolling for bass don't know about? You know, a lot of people want to catch fish a certain way. All right, and they get stuck in their head, well, I like the troll or I like the live line, I like to just cast lures. Everyday conditions change, and you have to be more open-minded about how you're going to go about your day. If the fish are scattered out all over the place, trolling's the way to go for them. If you got big bird plays, casting or jigging for them is the way to go. If you have bunker pods with fish up behind them real tight to it, and that's the only area that they're in, maybe the snag and drop is the way to go with it. Corey, again, what we were doing with the plastic eels, and you had talked about the subtle eels, it's just barely working over the bottom. And I figured, when I did that show, I figured, I'm going to flutter jig them. I said, I'm going to take Corey to school. And man, did I get a spanking. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess a lot of it is because they get keyed in to the sand eels. And then when I finally switched, 
and it took me a little while to get dialed in. Yeah, it's a very slow movement. You, you gotta think, these, these fish are trying to conserve energy, right? So if you're, if you're snapping your lure and it's coming up three, four feet off the bottom, that these fish are not gonna grab that as opposed to one that just kind of flutters over their face and almost like dances in front of them. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times, as you learned, it's like, it's just a slight lift and also it's a very slight tap. A lot of times these 30, 40 pound fish, you would think they're gonna pile on and you're gonna freight trade them where exactly. when they hit the bait and, and I'm gonna they hold don't. you on that thought because we're going on a commercial break and sure. I wanna talk about those subtle hits, which fooled me a lot too. You're, we're gonna be right back with Trophy Stripe Bass, the Saltwater Sports National Seminar Series returns after a few commercials. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Atlas Tracks, satellite tracking of recreational pleasure boats, supply vessels, and fishing fleets. Columbia Sportswear, stay cool and protected while fishing. JL Audio, ahead of the curve. ACR, building survival products since 1956. Florida Keys and Key West, visit FLAKeys.com. George will be right back. Welcome back to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. We're back. Trophy Stripe Bass, the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, presented by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats, and filmed on location at the IGFA. I'm talking to Corey Crochetier with the trophy striped bass that we were catching out of New England, Rhode Island to be specific, and the subtleties of working the soft plastic and that, it, trying to get on that subtle bite and know it's a bite. That was because you would think it, when I had come up, these big bass would just tear in it like a big grouper yep. would here. But it was a very soft thing until once you figure that out and when you get that little soft bump, is it an instant rod set? Take me through the subtleties of, of setting up and then tell me pound test leader you're using, what pound test braid versus mono, your take on that. Sure. Um, so when these fish are hitting, uh, a lot of times they're not like coming up and running through the bait and running off with it. A lot of times they're just, it's coming through their face, they're gonna suck it in, and they're just gonna be laying on the bottom, so they don't have to move far. So a lot of times that's what you're feeling. You're feeling basically the vacuum of the bait going in, and you have to feel that slight tap, and you wanna set immediately, because if they feel, you know, the, the lead or the hook or such, they'll spit it back out and you'll miss your bite. Um, and a lot of that has to do with your uh, size leaders also. Um, I know guys that fish 50, 60 pound floral don't get as many bites. I like to drop down to that 30, 40 pound range. Mm -hmm. um, and also when the current is really moving, um, 30 pound braid over 40 or 50 pound braid gets through the water a little better. You can use a lighter jig head and keep your bait in the presentation of it needs to be and in the zone it needs to be. Balancer, you're hearing the discussion on some of the subtleties involved in catching these fish. Well, I'll tell you one that, that, that you talked about comparing to snook, almost compared to sailfish in the kite fishing with uh, baits like Big Bunker or uh, Tinker Mackerel can be very effective because these bass move into shallow water over scattered rocks. And you go try to go in there with a bigger boat, it's hopeless. But you fly a kite in there with these live bait splashes on top can be very, very effective. Going back to what was said earlier though, uh, Paul Casanovo and his son decided they were gonna go kite fishing for striped bass in Maine with tinker mackerel, but they went to a reef that they fished that was in 20 or 30 feet of water. And they were very frustrated because they had these beautiful baits out on the kite and couldn't get a bite. But the, the tinker mackerel that they were dropping down deep consistently caught bass. They realized that you got a fish in the depth where the fish are feeding and they had to move from that deep water catching the stripers down deep into the shallow where the bass were looking for a bait up on top. So wherever you are, as has been mentioned many times, you had to get the bait where the fish are. Gotcha. Hey, Tom, again, subtleties and maybe trying to locate the bigger bass. We talked about that, that, that ocean run, the beachfront area, and their bunker schools and this and that. Uh, what other areas? And I, I know down out of the Cape May, I've done that chunking routine there as well. Uh, when you do the chunk down there, what kind of bottom are you looking for that, you know, that's a big area. Where do you, where, how do you know where to go and anchor up and set those chunk baits? So over recent years, it's been pretty much that we don't fish so much in the center of the bay anymore like we used to. Uh, these fish seem to come down, or these post-spawn fish come down out of the Delaware River and they'll hug really super tight to the Jersey side on the way down. When I mean super tight, like uh, coming up to the Jersey side, you know, you might have 10, 15, 20 foot of water and there's a hard lip where it comes in the real shallow water, like my boat draws a little more than five foot, I can't get up there. Mm -hmm. That's how shallow it is. 
And what we'll do is, especially on incoming tides, we'll go up, we'll nose the boat up on the lip and actually ground the boat, drop the anchor, just leave a bunch of slack in the anchor rope until the tide starts to come up and she'll start to float with the tide. And we'll even be casting shallower than that. We'll be casting towards the beach from there. Some of these fish are only in two, three foot of water. And usually during that post-spawn run is when you're gonna catch your biggest fish, your 20, 30, 40, even 50 pound fish. The long skinny ones are already spawned out. Very intriguing. And I want to thank our panel. You guys were terrific in uh, dishing out some of the subtleties involved in catching trophy striped bass. We have Captain Bouncer Smith, Captain Tom Daffin, and Captain Corey Quochetere. And we're going to be coming back with yet another topic of the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. Stay tuned. There you have it. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series will be right back next week with a totally different episode. If you want a chance to win our super grand prize Mako 17 Pro Skiff Center console, powered by Mercury Outboard, enter the drawing at nationalseminarseries.com. One lucky winner will take home this beautiful Mako boat. Best of luck.